We are going to get started here today. Thank you so much for joining us for this special two-hour presentation on gamification for e-learning with Angel Green. She is itching to share techniques and strategies for incorporating gaming into your instructional design. My name is Carrie Zenz with Allen Interactions and I'll be moderating the next hour. And also here with me is Brittany Lager providing back channel support. Before I turn things over to Angel, I'm going to cover a few housekeeping items. The first is your control panel. This is your control panel. We are all in listen-only mode today, so you have two audio options. The, your landline, your telephone, which if you click on that radio button, it'll provide you the instructions for dialing in, or you're the mic and speakers of your computer. Um, any questions you have today, please submit them as you think of them to the questions pane because we're going to be pausing several times throughout the two hours to answer questions. We're not going to hold them all till the end um, and hoping that we can cover, cover them all. Um, also, part of your control panel, you'll see the orange rectangle with the white arrow. That's your grab tab and that collapses and expands your control panel. And then below that is a blue circle with a yellow hand and a green arrow. That's the hand raising icon. And, uh, Angel is going to be asking you to raise your hand in response to some questions today, so just wanted to make sure you are aware of where that was located. You just have to click on that when, when she asks you to do that. Um, we're also um, very, we'd, well, we'd also love for you to share information from today's webinar on Twitter using the hashtag Game for Change, and you can follow us at Custom eLearning. And today's session is being recorded. The recording and presentation will be made available following today's webinar and we'll email out, out instructions on how to access those items along with a guide that's going to go along with this about this content so that'll also be included in the email as well. And then I'm gonna, I just want to give Angel a little introduction before I turn things over to her. Angel Green is Senior Instructional Strategist for Allen Interactions Tampa Studio where she is responsible for providing consultation and instructional design expertise to clients partnering to build engaging interactive learning experiences. With nearly 15 years of experience, Angel has worked for organizations such as IBM, MetLife, and PricewaterhouseCoopers, and holds both MS and BS degrees from Florida State University. An accomplished speaker, Angel has held positions as an adjunct instructor of public, speak public speaking and is past president of a Toastmasters International Chapter. She also frequently blogs on Allen Interactions e-learning leadership blog. With that, I would like to turn things over to Angel. Thank you, Carrie, for that introduction, and hello to all of you today. I am so honored that you have signed up to join me today. I know that your time is very valuable, and I will do my best to pack our time together with information and techniques that will help you in your quest, and yes, that pun was intended, to create learning that is both engaging to your learners and produces the behavioral and organizational changes that your business is looking to achieve. Um, it is my goal to immediately, like later today, to have you be able to utilize this tool that we've developed for interactions, and it's called the Taxonomy Alignment for Gaming, or TAG for short. Um, you could use this tool on projects that you are in the process of designing. This tool is great to help instructional designers plan. It is a way to set a common language among stakeholders and to begin brainstorming ways to include games and gaming techniques in your e-learning courses. But TAG also allows you to remain strategic and thoughtful in your design of learning. And it provides the opportunity to continue to use instructional design models like the Allen Interactions CCAF model and Bloom's Taxonomy to ensure that your learning is aligned to and in support of the behavioral objectives that your learners need to achieve. Along the way, I'm going to share with you tons of examples to hopefully spark your creativity and give meaning to this tool. I will say it right now, though. Two hours is not enough time to make everyone an expert or even bring you up to speed on gamification, game design, and game mechanics. So in order to best utilize our time together, um, I'm going to be focusing more on the practical and less on the theory. Um, after all, this, <laughs> the study of games and gamification is, is really so deep and so broad that it can swallow you whole. Um, there's an endless array of resource materials. Um, there are contradictions from experts. There are lively internet debates and even conflicting case studies. 
I'm going to be touching on some of the very basic fundamentals of game designs and game mechanics, but we're not going to go in too, too much depth about the theory. Um, there are tons of books and, in fact, entire college deg degree programs that discuss these and debate even the existence and validity of the word gamification at all. Um, really what this webinar is intended to do is to benefit those folks like yourselves who are tasked to design e-learning courses and um, who want to gamify their learning. It's for the folks who have potentially been asked to explore the industry and see what others are doing in terms of gamification and it's for those who just want to learn a little bit more. Um, this webinar is not going to teach you how to build the courses that I display. We have an authoring tool called Zebra Zaps, which I encourage you to learn more about. And um, really what we're going to focus on is when it comes to putting you know, the hammer to the nail, whether or not you actually need that nail, what size nail that you need, and not literally how you drive that hammer to that nail and get things done. So um, to get started, I would like to play a little game, if you will. Um, so on your screen right now, this should look a little bit familiar. This is a bingo card, and it has some pretty unusual squares. And to get bingo, as we know, we must have X number, you know, five out, five of the squares must be completed across, down, or diagonal. Um, don't start yet, but what I want you to do is I want you to look at the, the questions that you see on screen. And um, in the chat window that we have available to us, you're going to type in whether or not you can mark off one of these squares that you see on there. I'm going to go ahead and get us started, and I'm going to say that I can mark off that I have three or more children. So I'm going to mark that one off. And so what I want you to do is I want you to look at these on screen right now, and I want you to type in chat which square I can mark off based on your response. Ready? On your mark, get set, go. Okay. Practice is yoga. I see. Oh, my goodness. Practice is yoga has lived in a foreign country. Oh, wow, this is awesome. There's coming a bunch of them in here. Has more than three siblings. I was born in Pennsylvania. If anybody was born in Pennsylvania, you can do that. Allergic to cats. Doesn't have a Facebook account. Was somebody born in Pennsylvania? Has lived in more than five states. <coughs> Okay, we have one. Bingo! Yay! <laughs> Good. Deborah Walker, you made us have bingo. So thank you for participating in that. That was fun. I, uh, I find that this kind of activity really starts to get us to be engaged in this. I'm going to clear these off right now. <coughs> Excuse me. Sorry. So most webinars would start with a how many of us type of a question where I ask you to raise your hands and I wanted to shake things up a little bit. I wanted to get you engaged in the presentation. I wanted you to, to start to think about ways that we could introduce each other without being so boring and blah. And we actually recently included this activity in an instructor-led training program that we delivered as a way to replace that standard introduce yourself or introduce a table buddy. Instead, we came up with 100 questions and randomly placed them on bingo cards. The class got up out of their seats. They walked around quickly trying to get bingo by asking their peers to fill in one of the spots on their bingo card. <clears throat> Each person that they asked, however, could only fill in two of the spots on the card. So once the bingo part of the icebreaker was over, the facilitator went around the room and asked each participant to stand up individually. The other members of the classroom had to tell which bingo squares this person was marked for. So for, if I stood up, someone would say, I learned that Angel has three kids, is afraid to fly, and works out more than three times per week. The fact that the questions were unique and were not typical icebreaker questions adds to the fun factor. But it also helped initiate conversations. So during breaks and lunches and even the um, classroom in-classroom discussions, 
we were able to draw from some of the things Ed said on their, their responses to the bingo cards. So this makes the most of their time together in the classroom and it helps the participants build connections to form their own personal learning network or community of practice. So we were taking something that we were going to do anyways, which was introductions, and we gave it a challenge. We gave it a set of rules. We made it fun and we made it a little bit exciting. So we gamified the instructions. And so now I'm going to ask for a little bit of more participation from you as a group. I'm going to go back to my non-drawing mode. Um, I want you to raise your hand, and uh, Gary had talked to you about the potential to raise your hand. Raise your hand if participants think that emailing is interesting. Wow, a lot of people think that their participants feel that e-learning is interesting. That's good. Okay, so I want you to keep them raised or put them down if you don't feel that they need to be raised anymore or raise them for the first time. If you believe that your participants think that e-learning tests and quizzes help them learn, put yourself in the shoes of the learner and, and answer the question from their perspective. Tests and quizzes help them learn. Okay. And one more. Keep them raised or raise them back up again. If you believe that your participants think that e-learning gets them excited about doing their job. Yeah, they're starting to fall down now. The hands are falling. So for those of you who were able to raise your hand for all three, I really do applaud you. Uh, most of us though, live in a world where a new course is added to a learner's learning path on their learning management system and is met with a response that sounds a lot more like, ugh, than yay. Not times have I heard a learner shout out, ooh, I just got an invite to a new training program. I've got to log in and check this thing out. But I personally remember as a learner myself in some large organizations this disheartening feeling of searching through literally what were thousands of available courses in the learning management system and trying to find one that could help me better my skills at a specific topic. The story would generate that it would be me searching and searching and reading course and after course to and then finally finding one that best aligned with my needs and I would feel a glimmer of hope a glimmer of excitement and, and feel like okay I'm gonna do this I'm gonna get better at preparing my TPS reports to use an office space example then I would launch the course and one of three different things might happen Either after two minutes, I had completely checked out and was rapidly clicking next, 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 next to see how quickly I could complete the course. My record, by the way, in case you're wondering, is 38 seconds to complete a course that was designed to take 30 minutes, and I scored a 90% on the appointment. Thank you very much. Or I would launch the course, and I would sadly scour through the history of where the TPS report originated, why we had TPS reports in the present workplace, the complicated database on which the TPS reports resided, and the authority or regulations that surrounded the TPS reporting structure. I was looking for how I could improve my own completion of this TPS report, but where was that? I didn't see that in this course. I'd finished the e-learning, and then what I would do is I would go and find somebody who I could go to and I would ping them and I would say, hey, will you help me figure out how to do this TPS report so that I don't get these pesky emails or having three of my bosses come over to me and ask me where my TPS is. The last way that this scenario would probably play out is that I would find a course that was filled with great content. It was like a virtual user guide. And I would search around and look for the print button because I would want to use this later as a reference. And when I couldn't find that print button, I would take screen capture after screen capture and paste them into a Word document and then print those out. And I would use it later. Why am I sharing this history of my, you know, searching through LMSs and looking for something it is like a TPS e-learning course? Because I want you to know that I get it. 
I understand that what you're doing and what we're having learners do in the organization. And I understand that some of you are dying to try and avoid this. And I understand that you might not know how to avoid this. And so I'm hoping to help answer how we can overcome some of these challenges that we face. Do you ever look at the world of games that you see on the screen here? Do you ever beg for this kind of engagement and excitement that people have when they find out that a new update is coming? Do you think that when people get an email announcing a new version of Grand Theft Auto that they go, ugh, no. These folks get excited. I mean, really excited. They waited in line and when for days, literally, it's in line for Grand Theft Auto. And when the game finally arrived, they took that game and they went and they hid themselves up in a, in a basement somewhere and they played the game on end for days. And sometimes they didn't even stop to eat. They just played and played and played. And they were so engaged and so motivated to do this. And yet, does this look familiar to you? This is what we create. This is the course objective screen for a course on safety for roadside employees. It looks identical to the layout of any other course objective screen on any other topic in a multitude of LMSs around the world. And you would replace the, the title and the bullets and bam, there's your TPS objective screen instead of your safety screen that you see there. So while in the days when e-learning first arrived on screen that this type of format might have been okay, um, after all, some of us who have been around for a while, we're just exploring having computer desks and we've got that installed. Yes, I'm safe, I understand. But I've had to create courses in the past that avoided having narration or video or graphics, substantial size in the e-learning because the offices were on dial-up computers. The offices didn't have sound cards. And that was the environment that we lived in. So the default was minimize graphics, stick to some text. That's just the way that it had to be at that moment. So today's world is different. We've got a, a group of employees that are out there who are playing those games. It's the same folks that are taking your e-learning courses. We've got a thousand different ways for us to share information with our learner population. And our learners are smart about that, right? Our learners know that they can go out and Google search to find an answer. They can ping a friend for a, a quick tutorial. They can look on SharePoint for best practices, they don't need all of that in their e-learning courses any longer. Oh, and really, they're becoming used to the types of technology that they act with on a daily basis. They use Nike Plus, they earn points and badges on MyFitnessPal, they compete in words with friends, and often they're doing these things at work, right? And then on that very same computer that they're doing all of those fun things, they open up a course on the LMS and they find this and it's just And what we're trying to do is say, what if we could take all of those real things that we've seen in the gaming world and what if we could do it differently in e-learning? If in that same course on roadside safety, if it opened uh, like this, with a graphic novel, with humor, or a sense of fun even. Would that shake things up? Would your learners want to explore this rather than opening it up with the objectives screen? They might be wondering, what in the world am I looking at? And what has it done with the e-learning that I've known for all of these years, that I've known from the past? So the time has come for us to realize that it's, it's no longer in our best interest to create e-learning what, like what we've done in the past. The learners that we're dealing with are at a point where they almost don't need us to provide them with a virtual data dumps because most likely that information is much more accessible and easily searchable outside of the LLS. So it's now time for us to to why we got into this business in the first place. We got in this business most likely because we like to help people learn. We like to help them 
be able to do their job better. And so it's now time for us to take a look around at what our employees are engaged in and learn from the successes of those other disciplines. So with that, we enter the world of gamification of learning. And I do want to explicitly state that while the subject of the webinar is about gamified learning solutions, we're not here to discuss the etymology of gamification or debate the differences in learning games and gamification of learning. For the purposes today, I'm going to ask that you make the assumption, um, or I'm going to make the assumption that something is driving you to investigate how you might use gaming or game elements in your learning. And also for our purposes today, I would like to propose that we use Carl Kopp's definition of gamification, which is using game-based mechanics, aesthetics, and thinking to engage people, motivate action, promote learning, and solve problems. And so I want to take a moment and let's look at a few of the concepts in this definition. And I'm going to use my highlighting tool here. First thing I want to talk about is game-based mechanics. And the definition of game-based mechanics according to the book Game Mechanics Advanced Game Design Voices That Matter by a um, Adams and Dormans are the rules, processes, and data at the heart of games. They define how play progresses, when hap what happens when, and what conditions determine victory or defeat. Okay. The next word I want to focus on is aesthetics. So the aesthetic is the game interface, and game interfaces have an appealing context. Um, this can range from the 3D immersive simulations, like you might see in the world of work. Warcraft, for example, to the almost rudimentary look and very simple look of something like Minecraft. But in general, the context of games goes far beyond bullet lists and text on screen with an occasional stock image stuck in there. They are appealing and fun to look at and they immerse you in this situation that you're in. Game thinking. Game thinking, according to Professor Kevin Warbuck of the University of Pennsylvania, who is author of the book For the Win, Game Thinking, um, means that using all of the resources you can muster to create an engaging experience that motivates desired behaviors. So game thinking takes the concepts that games do well, like encouraging problem solving, sustaining interest from novert to expert to master, like leveling, breaking down big challenges into main steps, promoting teamwork, giving players a sense of control, reducing the fear of failure that inhibits innovation. Um, game thinking does not mean that you have to become a game designer. What it really does is require you to take a stack and to start to think why people would want to play a game in the first place. So you have to step out of the role of game player and start thinking about what motivates others. And so if you've joined us in the past for any of our webinars or read our blogs or the books that we've um, put out, a lot of this should sound familiar. Um, in this definition of gamification, we're talking about some of the same concepts that Dr. Michael Allen wrote about over years ago in his guide to e-learning. And then again, and forget everything you know about instructional design and do something interesting. Um, we call it MMM, Meaningful, Memorable, and Motivational. And so what we're doing is we're asking you to start making e-learning that is less boring, that you look for motivators of your learners, and that you make the course memorable. So I'm going to turn off my highlighting feature now and move back to normal drawing mode and come back into the screen here. And I want to say, I have to clear those off, sorry. I want to say that gamification is not a new term. Um, it goes back a long way. So I found in a 1976 issue of the Creative Computing Magazine that there was an article on learning with computer games. I mean, back in 1976, I can only imagine what the computer games looked like back then. But what we're, what we're saying is that this is not a new concept. But when early pioneers in the learning games industry came on board, what they did was they typically revolved around, you know, pedagogical um, child learning. You know, the the early entrees into the field of learning games, the where in the worlds of Car is Carmen Sandiego, they were focused on helping children 
um, learn in, in this education environment. They were focused less on adult learning theories. So I want to ask you in the chat really quickly um, to just type in really, you know, just a short sentence or, or even um, a, a half of a sentence of why, why are you interested in the topic of gamification of learning? What is it that you want to do differently or that entices you about the subject? So go ahead and, and provide some answers as to why. To increase motivation, I'm seeing more learner engagement, to make learners fun. You have young employees who are doing this. You want to make learning fun so that people don't blow it off. Effectiveness, gameful de design to provide strong intrinsic motivation, making it stick with generation wise. Yes. Okay. So these are all great reasons. Thank you so much for providing that into the text and into the chat. Improved job performance. I like that one. That's a good thing. So these are always real great, great ideas. And, and what we are thinking of why we want to gamify and they match exactly along with the things that you just put in there. We want to enhance learners' motivation. So remember when we first started the conversation and I mentioned the reaction to receiving an email that indicated that I had a new course available or even required on the LMS and I went from uh and I wanted to do the yay. How can we improve that reaction? How can we motivate our employees to want to take our course, to want to actively engage in the learning and to want to do a better job at their job. Um, secondly, we want to help focus on behavior enhancing tasks. When you're less concerned about delivering the content to an audience and instead exert your energy on devising challenges and consequences, you're better able to focus on behavior enhancing tasks. Essentially, you can get to work on getting employees the ability to do their job better. And finally, Gamifying your learning helps to create those meaningful and memorable learning experiences. So you want to be able to provide something that employees remember not only because of the fun factor that they have in the gaming, but because it helps them do their job better. They remember a mistake that they made in the course. They remember um, an interaction that helped them succeed and the steps that they took in order to achieve that success and they're able to take that and apply it to the job. So in the end what we're really looking to do is to get people to do the right thing at the right time and that's a quote from Dr. Allen and we believe that we can do that by using an instructional design model that we refer to as CCAF or context challenge activity and feedback. And again, some of you may have joined us on previous webinars and, and have read our blogs, but I do want to make sure, and, and we have tons of resources available on this, and so I don't want to spend too much time dissecting this, but I do want to make sure that we're all speaking a common language, because when we go to show some of our demos and examples and how you might be able to take into some of considerations these things, I am going to be saying CCAF or referring to one of these things. So. Let's start over here with context. And context is the framework by which you provide meaning. It's a situation and a place. Um, context would represent the sounds, the sight, and the interface you place the learner in. It is the setting of the story or the setting of the game. Challenge, on the other hand, is a stimulus to act. In the same vein that games provide players with a challenge to earn points or conquer over evil or clear the level, your learning event needs to provide a challenge to the learner. A challenge is not achieving an 80% on the multiple choice assessment on, at the end of the course, but is really grounded around situations that employees face. Activity refers to the physical gesture that the learner does in the interface. Do they click? Do they drag? Do they slide? Do they swipe? This is a human to computer interaction, so there are a limited number of options for the gestures that we can include, but there might be an infinite number of the variances of what it would look like on what the outcome is. So that's where we get to feedback, and feedback is the response back to the learner. Every action should have a reaction. 
And feedback is not just a great job or incorrect try again. It should be consequential in nature. It should be intrinsic when possible, and it should always be immediate. Now, judgment, on the other hand, judgment should be delayed. So you might not necessarily know whether or not you've passed the level or passed the game or passed the course or gotten everything right until you see the end result. But along the way, you should be able to have some sort of feedback or consequences to the actions that you take. So I hope that um, that kind of sets the groundwork for, for what it is that we're going to be talking about today. I've tried to create a common ground of, of what it is that we're referring to when we discuss gamification of learning and why it's important to use game thinking in your instructional design. So next we're going to be moving on to the difference between a serious game and a gamified learning event and then on to a guide to help instructional designers begin thinking like game designers. But I do want to pause right away to see that um, if you all have any questions out there right yet. Okay, we're looking like we don't have any questions, but if you want to type a question in now as you're thinking about it, that's fine. And if not, then we can just move forward and you can keep those questions um, coming in. Sounds any questions? Good, Angel. Okay. Yep, no, qu no questions. So let's, we'll just hopefully people have some as we keep moving along. And oh, I see stuff. some. I see some oh. coming in right oh, yep, now in the chat. Yep, here, yep, here's a few. Okay. Um, shouldn't activity really be what they're doing? That's from Thor. Okay. So I wanted to say hi to everybody, and I wanted this opportunity to, to kind of just dialogue with you as we ask these questions. So um, repeat that one to me. Shouldn't the activity re be really what they're doing? So, yes. Yeah. The activity that you're going to be building within this game that you're doing should reflect the actual activity that they are going to be doing on their job in some way, shape, or form. But really, the way that you do that is through the context and the challenge. The activity is for us to explain how a learner is going to, to, to interact within that computer interface. So if, am I going to click something? Am I going to participate in a conversation in which I need to make choices and have like a, a multi-choice that's there? Am I going to use a slider? Am I going, what are the options that I have to interact within in that game that I'm, I'm using. Other questions? How, um, another question from Marie is, how are you determining the correct feedback? That's a good question. And so that comes to us by talking to the people who actually do the work and actually are the ones who are in the field doing this on a day-to-day -day basis. So, uh, for example, I have lots of clients in a number of different industries, one of which are, and I'm going to show you some examples that they gave us today, is um, DBI services. And what they do is they do um, highway construction and they do, you know, line painting and striping on the roads and they do cleanups along there. They also do guardrail repairs. And I wouldn't know the consequences of some of the actions that they take unless I talked to the people that do their job day in and day out. And so you, getting that kind of input from subject matter experts, and sometimes um, we refer to them uh, in a term coined by Richard Seitz as subject matter enthusiasts, but those folks are really valuable and really integral in creating games that have realistic consequences. And Anytime that you can tie consequences to business, business metrics is also very important. So later in the program today, we're going to be talking about ways that you can use a points system. Um, and if you can tie that to things like customer satisfaction measures that go up and down or profitability that goes up and down or an outcome that's favorable, like you made the sale and you get the quota and the commission check, um, those types of consequences are very valuable because it really puts and brings home what it is that the actual consequences are for the learners. Um, other there's, an, there's another question from Jennifer. Her question is, how many of these concepts apply to ILT? Do you see that as a different conversation? So gamification, I mean, we're going to really focus on ways that we can do this in the e-learning course, but it doesn't mean that gamification can't be applied to an instructor-led training course. Um, when you go in the idea of having role plays, when you're taking on a cast of characters, that you're actually playing a role and you're 
involving yourself into that, you know, like almost the murder mystery type of a dinner, um, you have a specific outcome, you have rules, you have challenges that you're trying to achieve. So that is still a, a type of ways to gamify. So instead of just having a, an instructor up there giving you a lecture, they're involving you in it. They're making it fun. They're setting a, a set of rules along with it. And so that is a way to gamify the learning. I think we have time for one more question. Okay, this is from Meryl. Big question, how do you sell gamification to management? Management who are not training oriented. Right, and that, <laughs> is, a, that is a big question and, that, and that's kind of where we go to when we're saying we really need to make sure that we're not just gamifying or you know putting a game label on something um, that has no meaning for the actual workplace. And so any ways that we can show that this is the type of learning that actually engages employees because uh, Gartner, Pew, a number of these different resource organizations have showed us that employee engagement in their actual work is down to, you know, like 11% of people that are actually engaged in the work that they're doing. And if we can start to improve their engagement and improve their um, drive to complete the learning, then they're going to start to do things better in their actual job. And so um, we have a specific case study that we did with AutoNation that really helped them solidify that this type of a, of a game solution or you know incorporating game elements into their training really drove home performance change. And they ended up making tens of millions of dollars from the single investment of one course across their organization because it allowed for learners to participate in a game in which they practiced a conversation in which they saw intrinsic feedback so they saw the scowls on people's faces they saw them cross their arms if they made decisions that were not appropriate they saw that they lost sales that they were not able to, to sell the car and they got in trouble by their managers when they did this but it was all in the safe world of the e-learning course and so by being able to make those mistakes in that e-learning course they were able to better perform in the real world and so they were able to use the things that they had learned from making the mistakes in e-learning and put them in play while they were in their real job and they ended up selling more cars at a higher profit rate than the folks who didn't go through that so we have white papers on that as well okay so I'm gonna turn off my webcam and I'll be back again later and I'm gonna go back to the presentation Sounds thank good. you for those questions keep them coming in um, if we don't have time to answer all of these questions. We're saving the, the chat log. I um, would be happy to go through, and I think my webcam is still on. Let me get rid of that. There it is. Okay, I would be happy to go through and answer these um, these questions that come in that we just don't have time for today and I know that there is a lot of questions that came in just then and I'm hoping that we continue those to come in and I do encourage you to, to do that. So let's go back over to the presentation. When we start to think about how we can add some gaming elements into our e-learning and, and into our courses that we're creating, we are going to be talking about specific game elements. And so I wanted to discuss a few of the game elements that we feel at Allen Interaction are very vital to making a successful um, simulation or a successful game for our learners to go through. And the first one we want to start off with is risk. Now, risk is often a scary word for stakeholders and for instructional designers. Um, what we see often is that we worry that if we give our learners a challenge and they find it to be a little bit difficult that they um, or even if we allow them to fail that they that we're afraid that they'll get too frustrated and that we'll quit and so we've started to almost adopt the everyone gets a trophy um, little league type of a, of a mentality where we don't allow people to fail but what we, re we need to realize and what we need to be consultants with and about for our stakeholders is that failure is actually a good thing. And we all know that that's the way we learn, right? We make a mistake and we don't make the mistake again. But that it's also possible to minimize the, this randomness of risk and offer it in a manner um, by which the learner feels safe. Um, while potentially experiencing some mild frustration. But we don't want to get learners so frustrated out the gate that we quit. 
right away. So you want to start to you know, kind of level up the risk and increase the risk as you go along. It doesn't necessarily need to be that you send somebody into the, the hardest situation right out the gate. Let them have easy wins and then let them struggle a little bit and then let them win again. And you know, the same way that kind of Candy Crush starts off with some early wins, um, you're going to be having those kinds of early wins in the beginning. They could fail a little bit. They could struggle a little bit, but they'll come back, and it's okay. It's okay to have risk. Meaningful choices. We need to offer our learners choice in their experience, and it helps them feel in control of the learning. And somebody asked a great question, how do we know what the consequences are? Well, how do you even know what the choices are along the way? Choices need to be realistic. They need to be meaningful for the learners, and they should encourage them to think through choices that are close to one another. So it shouldn't be so obvious of an answer that it, it kind of dumbs down, for lack of a better word, the options that they have there. It should be meaningful for them. And again, I ask you and implore you to go out to those subject matter experts and enthusiasts and those folks that are learners who are actually doing this job and find out what their choices were. What, what kind of a quandary had they been in in the past? How did they handle it? It shouldn't be that a series of guesses that somebody makes throughout the entire course allows them to pass the course. The learner should see you know, reaction based on the choices and the risk should be com commensurate with those and in direct relation to the, to the risk that they're taking. So there might be some paths that lead to severe and dire consequences, but not everything is going to lead to this you know, world is ending, sky is falling type of an event. There are some that are just average and there are some that are the best. And so understanding the variance in the outcome is essential to setting the choices that you provide to the learners. And remember earlier when I was talking about how we could incorporate game thinking into our design? Well, the compelling frame is one of the reasons why gamif gamifying your learning is great. So when we can move beyond the bullet points and text on screen and instead show the scene, creates a, it creates a formal link to their real world. If we can make intrinsic feedback, that reaction to the facial expressions, that movement on the customer satisfaction score, maybe some statements that are made by customers in a social media setting. So we can mock that up and say that you know you provided um, some service to a customer and based on their experience they left a either a raving review or a horrible review of you on on Google or on Twitter. Um, what are those kinds of, of contextual elements that we can put in there to make it real life? I do want to come back to again some similarities that I found um, and it kind of became striking as I was going through some of these best practices for gaming elements. Um, the seven magic keys that Dr. Allen has provided in his guide to e-learning and I hope that you can see the alignment to many of these concepts of games and game designs. So building on anticipated outcomes, putting the learner at risk, setting the right contact, skill-based leveling, using an appealing context, participating in these multi-step actions, providing intrinsic feedback, and delaying judgment. If you look at most books or studies or courses on game design, you're going to find these kinds of concepts and topics that are in there. It isn't, this isn't a separation. To me, it became this logical, hey, this all kind of makes sense, and it is something that we can easily incorporate into our instructional design if we just take a minute to learn a little bit more about game design. And so what we want to do is we want to say, I'm going to learn a little bit about game design, but I'm going to base my structure and my game so that it's not just gaming for the sake of gaming, but I'm going to focus on the learning and organizational performance targets that my stakeholders are looking to meet. I'm going to create instructional interactivity to actively engage the learner's mind and to do things to help improve the skills and readiness with uh, among my learner audience. And so when we take the idea that we're going to have to um, think through this instructionally and think through this alongside some basic game design, um, it's not too far off of a concept. And so while I was thinking about this, I actually stumbled upon a great article 
that says there's arguably no difference between the requirements of the challenge category of ARCS model and Gagne's events five and six and the tenets of game design. So assimilation of these principles into serious game design is unnecessary, that they're already there. So as an instructional designer, you and I probably have had to do a little bit of cross studying in our lifetime, right? So when we were going to school, we probably might have taken some organizational psychology courses. We might have taken some um, courses on cognitive development, like the uh, Skinner, you know, we we'll go back to why people behave the way that they do, whether they have an intrinsic motivation or an extrinsic motivation. Um, you, you might have gone back to some of these theories. Now I'm asking you to incorporate another set of theories in your bag of tricks and that is those that are in the game world. And so I, I do want to clarify one other thing and that's the difference between serious games and gameful design or gamification. And so this matrix that you see up on screen um, is it's been used a number of different times going all the way back to you know thousands of years ago when we were originally discussing the difference between what is a game and what is just free play. But the arena that's known as serious games is a little bit different than gameful design or incorporating game elements into our learning. Serious games are wonderful tools. They are the ability for us to fully immerse somebody in a situation, start to finish the entire course, if you will, that's put on the LMS is one big game, right? So it is an entire game. You get a set of rules at the beginning and you go forth and you prosper and, and you do an entire game. Gameful design or gamification of learning is probably where most of us are going to find the ability to, um, to start to change. Because serious games, they can be expensive to build, they can be hard to get um, that kind of stakeholder involvement. But incorporating gameful design or gamification into the courses that you're already building is something that you can start to consult with your organization on, on a like, kind of a smaller scale. So, a typical course that you create might sound something like this. You have uh, a list of objectives that you're looking to achieve. And you might in the past have gone um, a content screen, a content screen, a content screen, and then an interaction. And in that interaction, it might have been a multiple choice question, it might have been a drag and drop, it might have been a true false, it might have been a multi-select, but you had some sort of interaction, and it might come every third to five screens or slides in your e-learning course. That probably sounds familiar to a lot of you. Okay, what we are proposing to do is to kind of flip that around a little bit. So you have a list of objectives. Yes, you're still going to have that list of objectives. Whether or not you need to show those to the employees is a different um, conversation altogether, but our thinking is, is that learning objectives are for those of us who are on the back end of training design and they help us justify why we're doing this training. They help us figure out what be behavioral changes that we're looking to make. When you put those list of objectives up on screen, what you'll find is that folks stay on that screen for about 1.1 second and click on next and they never read those. So um, the gameful design allows you to align specific interactions or specific games that you have you know, prototyped and thought through and brainstormed to the objectives that you're looking to achieve. And so Dr. Allen has created the objectives to treatments matrix and it's in um, Leaving Addy for Sam, one of the re recent books that, that was put out by ASTD Press. But the objectives to treatments matrix allows you to list down um, the, the objectives for the course and then align it to a couple of few different treatments or interactions or games, if you want to call them that, that are incorporated in your course. And so those are the moments in which you really want to incorporate some of these gameful elements in this game design. And so that's where we're really talking about how we can do this. So it's a part and it's game. It's not the entire course necessarily. Of course, if you can do that, if you have the budget and the time and all that stuff, that's really where you're going to see that behavioral change. But to help get those small wins, um, to help really start to drive home that this concept is working for an environment in our corporate world, we're going to focus on this section on the upper right-hand corner of the gameful design gamification. 
So um, Clark Quinn, who's now a friend of mine and is an industry expert, um, and he is the author of the Learn Lits blog, had this wonderful matrix on his blog. And um, he says that on this this spectrum from knowledge to skills, that there's a cross spectrum that's kind of direct to engaging. And so certainly there are times when knowledge is necessary. And so knowledge, you might do a game that's kind of like a flash card game. And so that's very direct and it's just at that knowledge level. And then as you start to move through up to the, you know, kind of getting closer to the skills section, um, a little bit less direct are quiz shows that you might have. So this might be, you know, a, a trivia question. It might be, um, and I'm going to talk about some of our examples of what we might do in this section here, but it, it's going to be uh, like a quiz show-ish. We're going to move up further along the skills line and then we're going to start to see some real behavioral change when we get over to um, the section over on the right hand side where we start to see scenario driven content, scenario driven exercises all the way up to the very top and you can see that's at the very point of the arrow and that is when we get into serious games. And so along the spectrum we have from knowledge to skills and we have from direct to engaging. And I thought that this, you know, very much showcased what it is that we're looking to do, that there's ways for us to incorporate games along all of these different areas. And so with that in mind, um, I would like to officially show you all the Allen Interactions Taxonomy Alignment for Gaming. And so this might look familiar to you. And again, I, I mentioned this at the beginning. You don't need to worry about kind of taking screenshots or something because after this webinar, you're going to have um, as part of the, the resource that comes along with this is this taxonomy. And it might look familiar to you. And if somebody would want to put in chat, what does this pyramid remind you of? What, what, yes, there we go. Rebecca out the gate. <laughs> A food pyramid. <laughs> I like that one. That's right. Blooms. Ding, ding, ding. Everybody got that one right. Okay, so I have some instructional designers on the line, which is great. So, what we were looking for um, is a way to open the dialogue, a way to start to align instructional theory that we're all familiar with, Bloom's taxonomy, with some of the concept of gaming and gamification. And so as you move up the pyramid, you're going to be getting, you know, a little bit more intense and a little bit more intense and a little bit more intense. But what we wanted to do is provide different types of games that align with the level of Bloom's verbs that are associated with it. And this really helps to start sparking creativity. This is something that you can take and show and discuss with, you know, kind of stakeholders. Because here's the thing. Um, that the, the, the stakeholders are familiar with games. Everybody can kind of look at this and say, okay, I know what a memorization game is. I know what a question and answer game is. I know what cause and effect game is. And so we're going to be moving up that pyramid. And so I'm going to now go through each of the different um, types of, of um, games that we have suggested here. And this is the part where it kind of really becomes um, interactive and I am going to be going out and showing demos and I'm going to be asking early for your, um, for your input, for your questions and for um, your patience as I launch different courses and I um, showcase these demos. So let's start with recall and memorization games. So recall and memorization games are fast-paced, quick recall and response testing with correct and incorrect responses. So these recall and memorization games are optimal when you're looking for rote memorization of fact. And I know that there are, um, in some industries, there are very few times when somebody actually has to memorize things. Um, but there are some industries and there might be some things within your own organization that you can think of that somebody just needs to know this information and just needs to be able to quickly recall it. And so um, some examples that we thought of were computer error codes, um, some common acronyms that you might have, 
some graphic identification, like there's these symbols that are the hazard warnings out here. I don't need to know why this symbol looks like a fan blade. I don't need to know why this symbol looks like a lightning rod. I just need to know that the, the symbol is there for a reason and that I need to know what to avoid and how to avoid getting myself hurt. And I just need to know what that is. I need to be able to remember this. And so I want to share with you an example that we did for um, one of our clients. This is from um, Delta Cargo. And Delta Cargo, um, they are the ones that take the, the packages and the products that are shipped under belly, under wing of the airplane. And they have warehouses throughout the world where they you know, transport this information or this, this uh, pieces of cargo. And pieces of cargo could be anything from mail to a pet to unfortunately a casket. I mean there's every type of thing that, that go under wing of the airplane. It's not just the luggage that we that we put into the airplane when we are as passengers in there. And so one of the things that they needed to have their employees know that are working in these Delta cargo warehouses is that um, city codes and um, the the airport codes is critical in their being able to do their job quickly and efficiently. So sure, they could have on hand a reference document that they could look up each of the different codes, but that's time consuming. And these folks don't have access to computers while they're right there out there, you know, operating the forklifts and taking packages off of the planes and all of those things. What they have to do is they have to look at the destination city that's on that package and they have to know what that code is. And so I want to show you this game and so I'm going to um, again ask for your patience while I pull this up. Okay. You should be able to see this now. So um, this is the city code game and um, what we're going to do is we're going to go ahead and get started. And you can see some of these elements of gaming. And so I want to stop here and I want to talk to some of these things. So one of the ways that you can incorporate game, uh, a game feel is by the use of leveling. And so you're going to have 32 city codes that they consider to be at the starting level, level one. So those are ones that you should kind of know um, rather quickly. Then you're going to know um, levels two through one, or levels two through two, level three, one, and three, one, three, two. So you're going to level up, right? I also want to point out that we do have a reference here. So should somebody want to go and look at the reference before even getting started or at any point during the game to stop and realize that they're getting a lot of these airport codes wrong <laughs> and they can have access to this reference. So this takes away some of the idea that we don't want our learners to feel so frustrated. This is part of the it's okay to fail because we have a safety net that we have incorporated in there. So I'm going to go ahead and start the game. And what I want you to see on screen right now, this is a common technique that's used in gaming. And it's called onboarding when we call um, when we have gaming. So, so onboarding means I allow my learners to become familiar with the environment in which they're going to be playing in. So um, sometimes, depends on the type of gamer that you are, you might like to go through the onboarding type of a thing or you might just go ahead and start the game. Um, I know I've watched my children when they play games and since they couldn't read at first they kind of skipped through it. Now sometimes the games that they're playing have more of a story dialogue that goes along with it and so they stop and read it. Candy Crush, whenever you move up to a different section, kind of explains a little bit with that cute little characters that come on screen and they have those little text bubbles that come out of their mouth of what they're saying. That's onboarding. And so a best practice when you're looking to incorporate gaming into your, um, into your learning is to always have the ability for learners to onboard to the game before you just kind of throw them in it. I'm going to go ahead and start the game. I am going to um, not do so well in this game. I'm going to just go ahead and say that I am not the expert when it comes to knowing airport codes and I'm not going to be so successful in this. Okay, so Minneapolis-St. Paul, 
MSP, I know that one, because <laughs> we are based out of Minneapolis. Cincinnati, Ohio, I'm going to take a guess and say it's C-I-N. Uh, got that one wrong. That was CVG. Um, New York Kennedy is JFK. I've been there a few times. Um, Paris, France. I don't know what Paris, France is. I'm just going to Paris, France. Nope, CDG. So you can see um, that a lot of these are um, international because we're not just talking about folks that um, send things through on the United States. This is an international game. There are international areas um, throughout the entire world where Delta Cargo serves. Atlanta, I know that one, ATL. So I'm going to go ahead and stop now um, and go back to the presentation. I know that people are saying that there is a delay in between um, in between what you're seeing and what is on screen, and so I apologize if you know you kind of had that lag time in between what I'm showing and, and what I'm talking about. And so I'm going to try to do a better job of uh, slowing down a little bit. Unfortunately, the games move at the speed that they move, and so I can't really just pause that. But what you saw. Um, in the screen here is you could see how I was doing and what my correct count was and there is a rule there is a rule that's built in that you have to get X number of the city codes correct before you can move on to the next level and um, people have really reacted well to this game because what they had in the past was they had a binder or a worksheet that had a list of the city codes and a lot of people would just make flash codes and self memorize and so this way it allowed for them to go through um, the the actual kind of game environment here to see what their score was to better their score the next time to try it again to go back at any time and to randomize it because oftentimes when we have our own set of flashcards um, we start to feel uh, an ability to cheat a little bit, right? So this was uh, randomized. And we've had really positive reaction. Also, um, we didn't just have a multiple choice question, right? So I want you to take a look at the context. While this is a very simple context that we're putting the learner into, um, so we are, I'm sorry, there's a pop-up there, sorry. Um, what we did was we put the map of the world, right? Because that's really what it is. And we zoomed into that location. So now I'm making some sort of connection between what you're asking me and where my plane is flying. And so it did a little bit more than just what the flashcards could have done because it took you and it zoomed into that location on the world. And so the context was more appealing and more fun. Okay, I'm going to go back to the, the um, tag tool here, and we're going to move up a level. We're going to move into the judgment games. So judgments are questions and answers with correct and incorrect responses. And so when you hear judgment games, you're thinking about when learners should be able to explain or interpret or compare or do some of those of um, the verbs um, that, were, that were used uh, in Blooms. And so um, the ju judgment games are um, sometimes quiz shows, not always. And so what I'm trying to help you do is break the mold between um, the judgment games that we've used in the past, where it's been a Jeopardy game, um, where it's been something maybe called Trivia Trainer, where it's been a family feud, where we're trying to, what I like to call gamify just for the sake or, of gamifying. So what we're going to be doing in this example that I'm showing you is we're going to be doing a judgment game that you are making choices, but you are making choices in an environment that's a little bit fun. So if you see on screen here, this is for that same company, um, D'Angelo Brothers, DBI Services, and um, that's the same one that I showed that graphic novel. They like to make things a little bit playful in their environment. And so what I had um, delivered this presentation in the past, and I've seen this guy up here on screen, people have told me he reminds them of a color form. And I know, again, I'm dating myself right there, but he does look like one of those color forms that we used to play with, for those of you that were um, of the same kind of 70s, 80s generation, but I remember the way that it smelled and the way that it felt and the magnets and I put it on and I would dress them all up, right? So this was a game that we had to have people decide what personal protective equipment that somebody would use 
when they've been asked to um, sorry when they've been asked to do a specific task. So in this case, we see that Pat has been asked to use a weed whacker to clear some brush on the side of a busy road. Okay, so I'm going to go ahead and again, I'm going to ask for your patience while I go through and pull up this game. Okay, so on your screen now, you should be seeing um, the game. And again, we have onboarding. And this is one of those best practices. So on the left, you're going to see our model Pat. Your goal is to make sure that Pat is properly protected for any job assigned. You're going to be, in this area, you're going to be reading a description of the assignment that Pat has been given and the number of PPE that's required for this job. Next, you're going to use your mouse. This is the activity. So when we were talking about what is the activity, this is literally the activity. I'm going to use my mouse and I'm going to drag onto Pat the PPE that you believe is necessary for safely completed the job assigned. And at the bottom, like I mentioned also in the, the Delta game that we built um, for them in Zebra, over here we can see that we have a resource document that's down here. So if I'm unsure about what PPE should be used, I can always reference the PPE resource document by clicking here. So let me tell you folks, what we did not do is we didn't send them through a series of of um, text pages leading up to this that said if you're using a weed whacker you are to use uh, these five pieces of personal protective equipment. If you are using a chainsaw you are to use these you know, seven pieces of personal protective equipment. Now go play the game. We literally said hey part of the responsibility of the folks that work for us is knowing what personal protective equipment to wear at any given moment. And so you have a resource that's available to you, but see if you can go ahead and figure out what Pat needs to wear. So when we're up for it, we have our guys again, and this is kind of what I'm saying about being fun, right? These guys are playful. He's got a cigar. He's got some gold chains. These are the owners of this DBI services, and these are caricatures that we created of this. So when we're ready to get started, we're going to go ahead and click go to get started. So. Pat has been asked to use a weed whacker to clear some of the brush on the side of a busy road. I want you guys, you have no idea, I don't think, about PPE, maybe you do, about what you need to wear when you use a weed whacker. I want you to chat in what you think um, are the PPE pieces that I should drag over for Pat. Go ahead. Okay. I see safety glasses. I see helmet with shield. I see a safety vest, I see boots, I have one more and I'm going to go with the gloves. Okay, not quite. The correct PPE pieces will remain on him. Let's see if we can do it again. Okay, so we had those ones deleted and now we have this one. I, I saw somebody say the long sleeve shirt. Let's drag that one. Oh, that wasn't right it either. So let's take the ear protection. Jennifer mentioned the ear protection. Right. Safety glasses, ear protection, and a reflective vest and glasses will, and steel toe boots will keep Pat safe while using the weed whacker. And then we move on to another one. And we allow them to go through. And we saw, okay, I have two of four of these. So I know what my progression is. I know that I'm kind of leveling up. I know that I'm going to get a little bit more difficult in my questions. You know, he's now in a moving truck with his windows down. And we're not going to go through all of these anymore. So thank you for your participation and, and figuring out what that PPE was that was necessary. But how else might I have treated this? As an instructional designer, I might have said, just like what I said before, that... Um, I'm going to show a list of personal protective equipment. I'm going to explain this is a hard hat. A hard hat is used in the following instances. These are chaps. Chaps keep your legs safe when you're using a chainsaw and helps, you know, whatever it might be. These are gloves. Gloves are used whenever. And I might have gone through a series of those. And then I might have put the question out there. Sure, I might have said, if you're asked to use a weed whacker out of this so list of of PPE, select the five things that you need to use. And then I might have a text and a little check mark next to it and click, 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 submit. 
but that's not nearly as fun and it's kind of engaging for me to try this and to get Pat dressed up, right? That's, that's incorporating a little bit of fun into it. It's not putting a bunch of data out to them. It's allowing for people to use the resource when they feel that the resource is necessary, when they're struggling a bit. It's having that lifeline that's available to them. And what that allows you to do is it allows you to put the content in context. So I might have driven the learners through the content in the past, but they had no contextual basis by which to put it into, into play until I asked them that question at the end that said, Pat has been asked to do this, and now which ones do you have? And that's the only time that you're asked now to put that content into context. Well, have them do that right from the start. And if they need the resource, it's there for them. So I'm going to go back over to the presentation. And we're going to go up one more level. We're going to talk about consequence games. And consequence games are when we're asking for cause and effect based on decisions. So this good, better, best concept that we might have. And it's aligned to the Bloom's verbs like solve and calculate and produce and report and minister and show. And Consequence games are optimal when you want learners the opportunity to make mistakes and witness the outcomes of these mistakes in a safe environment. So learners proceed through a series of actions, steps, or choices, and then experience the outcome of their decisions. So you can use this when your level of knowledge is kind of procedural or rules-based and that the learner cognition aligns with that application level of Bloom's taxonomy. So over here on the left-hand side of the screen, I know it's a little bit small for you there, but this is a consequence type of a decision that's being made. So I, as the learner, have obviously made a, cons a choice that didn't have the right consequences. I can see that this meter here, it's very small, but it says min and max, and it's over to the min side. And their facial expressions are not too good, right? So we've got people with their arms crossed and scowls on their faces. It doesn't look like I'm doing a good job of making the sale of this, you know, car that I'm looking to sell. This was for AutoNation. Now, an example that I do want to show to you is the consequence game um, that we built for the Operation Lifesaver group. And Operation Lifesaver is a nonprofit organization that's um, really focused on keeping people safe around railroad crossings. And this course was specifically di designed for folks that had their commercial driver's license. So these are folks that drive big rig trucks, they might drive box trucks in the city, but basically what the, um, the Operation Lifesaver group had asked us to do was to create a course that um, allowed for the, the drivers to practice how they would approach a railroad crossing, how, you know, what the series of events that they would do. And there is a specific series of tasks that somebody needs to do when they are crossing through a, a um, a railroad track when you're a driver. You have to slow down in, in an appropriate amount of time. You have to um, stop, you have to roll down the windows, you have to look both ways, you have to do what they call rock and roll. You have to you know, turn down the radio if you have it loud so that you can listen. And what we wanted to do is to show the consequences of what would happen if maybe you didn't follow those instructions. So I'm going to go ahead and launch this course. So on screen now you see the Operation Lifesaver course and um, what we are doing is we have a brief introduction and then we can go right into the, you can go through an orientation and then you go through three different trips. So orientation is, again is our example of onboarding and when you come into the orientation you can learn about all, all of the different areas on screen. And I'm going to go ahead and turn my audio off because that's distracting for me right now. But you can learn about your GPS system. You can learn about all the different things that you have on screen. So I can go forward. I'm going to go back and I'm going to actually hit the road. Okay, so I'm going to go into our, four, our first um, example here. 
And so I'm going to hit the road and I'm going to do a um, semi-truck and I'm going to be delivering furniture. You can see that this context is fun, it's playful, there's a cup of coffee here. Um, you guys can't hear it on the line but I can hear it in my um, ears <laughs> as we go through um, and it's telling me you know, what I need to be doing and um, there is audio that's involved in this. So I'm going to hit the road with this semi-truck right now. I'm going to start here. And as I'm going along, you can see that my scene is moving. I've got, because I was in the onboarding example, so I've got a railroad track that's coming up here. So I know that I need to start slowing down. So I'm going to slow down. I'm going to bring my speed down. I'm going to come down a little bit further. I might, be, I might be slowing down a little too fast. I never want to get to the point where I run the, the stop sign, but I am going to show you what the consequences are if we do run the stop sign on the next one. So we're going to come down and do one right and make sure that I stop appropriately for the one. Okay. And so I'm going to look left. Okay. I'm going to look right. Rock and roll. I don't see anything coming. I'm going to go forward. And I'm going to go and I'm going to increase my speed because I made it through that one. And we're going to go and we're. And I've completed that one. So now I keep going forward. And I'm going to the next one. And you can't hear it, but oh gosh, there is loud music in my ear right now. So I'm going to turn that music down. And I see that I have a railroad crossing coming up. And I can hear a train whistle, but I'm not going to stop because I want to show you what happens if you don't stop. In my ears, I just heard, and I know I could potentially use speakers, but I, I, I don't have that ability with the way that my microphone's set up. But this, this demonstration is available online to anybody that wants to take it. Um, it's an open source course that anybody can take. But you can see that the consequences that I'm seeing are that it, you fail to stop and were hit by a train. The truck was, these are newspaper clippings, truck stopped on tracks is struck by driver, or is struck by train, driver is killed. Train de derailment due to truck collision closes third street, and a man dead after train truck collision. And so what I'm doing in this is I'm showing realistic consequences of what would happen if I don't make the right choices in the environment. So this is, in essence, a consequence type of a game. I'm going to come out of this game and I'm going to come back into my presentation and I do have to stop this game or else I'm going to hear that the whole time. <laughs> so um, I'm back at the, the consequence game here and I did want to take a moment because I know that I'm seeing lots of um, questions that are coming in. So I'm going to pause right now and I'm going to ask for um, some questions at this moment before we move on to the next level. Hey, Angel. Yeah, we have a couple questions. Um, okay. Cheryl asked, this is um, regarding the Delta City Codes game. Before mm -hmm. the learner played the game, they must have been given content. What does that look like? Okay. So um, I, I think I might have answered that question already, but I do want to provide that answer to you. The Delta City Codes questions um, were never, we, we never gave them any content before. They were thrown into that just the same way that you and I were thrown into that. There was that resource document that was available up to them at the top of the screen, and so they could go out there and they could see what that, that resource was, similar to the PPE course, um, that we didn't have uh, a series of text and answers, uh, a series of text slides that came before that. We just immediately threw somebody in there and provided a resource document that they could even print out and then have on hand with them. So. Remember I told that story in the beginning about how I really would find that this you know, checklist was valuable in my TPS report search and so I screen capped everything and I put it in a Word document and printed it out. Um, that kind of an information is great. Those kinds of resources are awesome. But we want to make sure that the learner knows when and why that they should be using those. And really when you throw somebody into a challenge like that without doing a bunch of upfront teaching, teaching, um, you're going to be showing them that there's a reason why they could find this, this tool useful. There's a reason why that resource document is provided for them. Next question. Okay. Um, 
there's a question about if you have any suggestions on what particular software application you would recommend to design gamification courses in. Right. So the um, the City Codes course that you saw was developed in um, in Zebra Zaps, which is the Allen Interactions tool um, that we have. It's our proprietary tool. It's open. It's cloud based, and it's uh, not very expensive. <laughs> and I would recommend that you check out Zebra Zaps. So we can you know potentially have um, demos and webinars that we have for training on how to use um, uh, Zebra Zaps. Uh, other tools that you can use, um, really anything uh, these days will allow you to have some sort of, especially at these kind of lower level, let's just say, these lower level um, of, the, of the pyramid of the tag document, um, you know, Storyline, Captivate, um, Flash, HTML5, any of the development tools that you're already using, you can start to use in a different format. There wasn't um, anything more than like a drag and drop. So for example, that PPE course that I showed can be done um, with uh, the new version of Articulate Storyline. Of course, that you can also do something uh, with drag and drop in Zebra Zaps. You can also do a drag and drop in Flash. Um, the multiple choice questions that you had in the um, cargo tool, the cargo training tool, which is the one that we created in Zebra Zaps, um, that one is just a series of multiple choice questions and it's just changing the frame, if you will, of where on the world that you're actually asking that question. And it's keeping a, a, a slight array in the background of what that number is when it, when it advances your score. Okay. Okay. Um, there's another question about graphics. Um, mm -hmm. You know, if, if you don't have a graphic designer available, what do you do? And then there was a question about where the, gra where the graphics came from for that the Operation Lifesaver course. Um, if you can answer either one of those. Yeah, so if you don't have a graphic designer that's available to you, there are a number of different stock photography um, sources that we use um, that any anybody can can go out to find. And a lot of them, like for example, the eLearning Brothers. The eLearning Brothers um, has a series of, of um, cutouts of people that have different facial expressions. And so when you're trying to do intrinsic feedback, like that AutoNation example where they had that scowl on their face and they had that, that look in their eyes, um, those kinds of examples are available at eLearning Brothers. Um, but when you're starting to move to the shift of graphic design, uh, or I'm sorry, of gamification, you are going to have to start to think about how you can make your graphics more appealing. And so sometimes that might be that you could contract out graphic work. Sometimes it might be that you yourself take some courses, some online, maybe there's some open source MOOC courses that you might be able to take on graphic design and, and be able to start to incorporate those things in there. But you really are going to have to kind of up the ante in graphics because there's just really, even though Minecraft is kind of simplistic in its nature, it's still a graphic interface. It still has that appeal of the context. It might just be that you go out and you take pictures of what it looks like. I mean, we literally have done that in the past where our projects don't have a high budget and we needed to self-select the graphics. And so we ourselves have taken our cameras, and digital cameras are great these days, and have gone out on the side of the road, into model homes, into car dealerships, and taken pictures ourselves and asked people to kind of change their facial expressions or set the scene by taking a picture of the inside of the car dealership uh, or take, set the scene of taking the picture of the car ourselves. And so it really doesn't have to be all that. I mean, we're not talking about 3D avatars in this immersive simulated world. And like I said, those are the high budget ones. But when you come down in the level that we're talking about right now, there should be plenty of available resources in the online kind of stock photography sites and potentially some of the things that you can do yourself. Another question? Hi. Hi. Um, yeah, another question is from Marie. She says, do you have an indication on the ratio of hours spent designing versus results per level in the taxonomy? Example, 20 hours design versus one hour learning. Right. Yeah, so that's a good question. And so in my original um, example or, you know, when we kind of were going back and forth internally about the development of this tool, um, I had included things like learner seat time. And it kind of became a little bit um, disconcerting because we couldn't really pinpoint a number on that. So 
for example, that Delta Cargo game that we played back and forth. So at the lower levels, um, you might run through a number of different leveling options. So in that Delta Cargo game, we went from like the base level one all the way up to level four. Total seat time might be an hour for you to get through all of those different levels. But that individual 30 questions that you ran through could have taken eight minutes, could have taken 10 minutes. You might have to go back and do it again if you fail. So that kind of is why we didn't want to put that in there because it could be a little bit of um, you know kind of a misnomer if you will but at the earlier levels the recall and memorization the kind of judgment you want to make it short and sweet you want to make it to the point you don't want to take the learner through this immersive entire simulation that that's saved for later but it doesn't mean that total time in the game or total time in this course that you're creating needs to go down at all. So it could be that you're kind of scaffolding and that you're building up the levels. So you might have one interaction that's a level of the recall and memorization and then one interaction that's a level of the judgment and then you start to move up and you go to consequences and that might be you know how you scaffold your learning using your own instructional design knowledge of you know building upon past wins and building upon past successes to have a capstone type of a of a level four if you will interaction that you can run through okay Okay. Great. All right. So we're going to go ahead and, and keep on going. I'm going to turn off my webcam and I'll be joining you back again in a few minutes. Yeah. Sounds good. And I just wanted to add, John John had um, suggested Poser and Daz Studio are easy to learn and you can create facial expressions and poses. Okay, perfect. Thank you so much for that, John. That's a good suggestion. All right. We're going to go ahead and move forward. So strategy games. So I'm going to go back to the, I have this one out of order, but that's okay. We're going to go back to the pyramid. I wanted to show you um, where we last left off. And that was at the strategy game. So strategy games are um, puzzles, challenges, and they're solution-driven experiences. And so we're moving up in Bloom's taxonomy to the analyze, the compare, classify, prioritize type of verbs that are associated um, with those levels. And so um, an example that we have for that, let's see, okay, so we're going to the optimal when the learner's decision-making skills determine the outcome. So strategy games can work, and now we're really starting to move the needle to change the behavior rather than to simply test the understanding. And so you want to use these strategy games when knowledge is procedural or soft skill based in nature, and it aligns to kind of that analyze section on Bloom's taxonomy. So if you see on screen here over to the left hand side, again this is kind of small, but I want you to take note to these um, dashboards that are down on the bottom. And so this is a course that was created for Manhattan Associates, who's one of our partners. Um, we've won a couple of awards with their courses and are really honored to be a true partner with them. Um, but this was a game that was called the Supply Chain Game. And in this in this um, instance, what we did was we had these meters and these gauges. So learners would make decisions to each of these different events that were on screen. And based on their decisions, the first meter over here to the left is the transportation cost. The middle meter here, and this is you know similar to a dashboard that they might have on their computer system, this is a labor cost. And then the third is a, a dashboard or a meter on their inventory. And so based on the decisions that I as the learner make in my strategy, in my decision making, realistic consequences occur and realistic feedback occurs. And those realistic feedbacks are actually tied to performance objectives that the organization is looking to achieve. They are looking to keep their transportation costs at a minimum, they're looking to keep their labor costs at a minimum, and they're looking to keep their inventory at the right level so that it doesn't have a shortage and it doesn't have an overage. And so if I make a decision to reroute a shipment, let's just say that there's a, a hurricane that's blowing through in the south and I choose to reroute my shipment and instead of taking a, a freight train, I decide to send it via cargo airline, um, I'm going to increase the cost. So my transportation cost is going to skyrocket. My you know, labor cost might remain the same because it doesn't matter you know, who is taking it, the same a number of people are going to have to um, 
be working on it, but those kinds of decisions that I make are going to affect these meters. Now it can be something as detailed as that, or it can be something as kind of fun and playful as what you see on screen. So what you see on screen right now is a course that we developed for, and this was a long time ago, um, this is a course that we developed for line cooks at a restaurant. And so you can see on screen a couple of different things that I want to point out that are, you know, kind of gamified. Again, we have the reference document down here at the bottom right. There's a reference document. We have an interface that is engaging and is something that draws us in. And then up here at the top, we have a timer that's going back and forth. So that's a gaming element to have a timer or some sort of time pressure. And then we have levels that um, we can go through and increase our levels. Um, we have a, uh, I'm going to go ahead and show this to you, but I would encourage you to, if you're interested in this game, we have a um, demonstration, um, and Denny's, this is for Denny's, and um, Steve Lee has, uh, from Allen Interactions, has built this in Zebra Zaps and shows this in a demo that we have on the Zebra Zaps website on how, you know, he was able to recreate what we had done ages ago in um, an antiquated technology that's no longer even used anymore, but that we were able to recreate this in Zebra Zaps. And, um, he, we're going to be having this serious game webinar and we're doing this one next week that we can mail this out to you and he can walk you through how he actually created creates this in Zebra's apps. But I do want to show this to you because this is a fun game and I don't have anything to do with being a line cook except for if you count Sunday morning breakfast that we have at our, that we have at our house and I feel like a line cook because I'm either making mama's pancakes or I'm making French toast and there's bacon going and sausage and um, omelets and all kinds of fun stuff. So I guess technically I am a line cook um, once a week. <laughs> but in this lesson you're going to practice the timing of food preparation to make sure hot food is served hot and that each ticket is sold in less than 10 minutes. There's my challenge. Use the reference section to review cook times before you start. So that is where we said in the past you might have sent somebody through and learned all about the different cook times but instead just go ahead and try it. And here we have the onboarding, right? This is one of our best examples of onboarding, but we have a ticket that's going to be prepared. And so for each ticket, you're going to choose when you drop the items onto their cooking station by dragging the item on the equipment where it is cooked. You want to drag the steam table items directly to the plate at the appropriate time. Your challenge is to figure out when to start each item so that everything on one ticket is ready at about the same time. Because the worst thing is if I finish the eggs first and I'm waiting for the bacon to be done, then I have cold eggs and I'm waiting and waiting and waiting for my bacon. So when I go to serve it, I'm going to have cold eggs. Or if I put my eggs on and I don't pay attention to them and I burn my eggs or I burn my toast or one of those things because I don't serve it to the plate when it needs to be served to the plate. So items are done. You can see this um, as they glow. And when they glow yellow, they're done. When they glow red, they're overcooked. So we want to drag them to the plate before they are overcooked but after they are done. When all the items are on the plate, you click on the sell button. And basically that's like when the, the Denny's cook would be like, order up, and the, the um, server would come and grab their order. Each order needs to be completed within 10 minutes or less. And so the timer on here is 10 minutes, but it's not really 10 minutes. We're going to simulate what the world of 10 minutes were, because if we actually had to wait there, it would be rather boring, right? So we're going to speed up the time. Keep practicing until you earn two diamonds and click help at any time to review these instructions. So we're going to go ahead and let's go ahead and go to begin it. So on my ticket right now, I've got scrambled eggs, sausage, bacon, hash browns, and white toast. So I'm going to say that the bacon probably takes a lot of time. So I'm going to put that on my meat grill and I'm going to let the bacon start to cook. And then I'm going to take my sausage and as that's going, I'm going to go ahead and put that in there. And I'm going to make some mistakes so you guys see this. But I'm going to go ahead and throw the toast in the toaster now and drag that in there. And I'm going to put my hash browns onto the flat grill now. And I'm going to wait just a few more minutes and I'm going to put my eggs up. Oh, 
you can see that something's going on over to the right that my um, toast is there. So I'm going to pull my toast over to my plate and I'm going to go ahead and set it down. I've got my eggs cooking. I've got my meat going. Uh, my eggs are going to be done. So I'm going to go ahead and drag the eggs over. I'm going to let this bacon burn a little bit because I want to show you kind of what happens when you do things wrong. But we're going to let that burn. Um, and as they become available, I'm going to go ahead and serve them. Now my toast has been sitting out there for a long time, so I'm probably not doing so well with my toast. Okay, so my hash browns are done. I'm going to put that out there. And my sausage is done. I'm going to put it out there. And my bacon, you can see, has turned red. And so we want to make sure that we get that bacon off because that bacon is fried. And so all of my things are on the plate now, and I'm going to go ahead and click my sell button. So how did I do? Not so well. So while I was able to get everything done on time, I didn't meet the quality. So the quality measure for my eggs would have been top quality yellow, eggs overcooked or the food was cold. So I made some mistakes along the way and I saw the consequences of those mistakes. <coughs> Excuse me. But this game is fun. I like to play this game and it really becomes fun as you advance in the levels because you start to get multiple tickets that come in and it's almost like the diner dashes that we have it's almost like those fun games that we play just for fun sorry guys I had to mute for myself for a second I'm losing my voice talking so long okay I'm gonna go back over the presentation and we're going to move over <clears throat> to the next level up. And that is the exploration game. So exploration games are when we're looking for the opportunity to reframe, to evaluate, to judge, to summarize, to assess, to estimate, you know, those kinds of Bloom's verbs. <clears throat> And they are nonlinear branching games. They might have multiple outcomes based on decisions. As you move up in the level um, throughout this entire tag tool, what you're going to find is the amount of time that it takes both to complete the development of this as well as the time that it takes for the learners to go through this game starts to increase. <clears throat> so you can think of it as these bottom ones are kind of inexpensive for people to build. Um, they don't take long time for our learners to go through them. But you can also look at this as a way to scaffold, like I said, your learning. So you might start off in a course and start off at the judgment, move your way up the, the, the entire taxonomy until you get to a point where you say, okay, this is about as far as I can take it in my own development. Um, this is about as far as I can, I can get. And I'm going to have this be like kind of the capstone moment. And so strategy to exploration games are probably where most of us are going to hit the, we can't go any further than, than that. But I still want to show you that there is the potential to do those kinds of games and that um, if you have the opportunity to do them, that is really beneficial. So exploration games are optimal for allowing learners to explore a variety of options in order to achieve different outcomes. So these are very similar to real world. And I like to tell the story that in the real world, in my 15 plus years of actually working, that nobody has ever come up to me and said, Angel, quick, A, B, C, or D, what's the answer to you know, this customer's concern? And then I chose from a number of different options. And then they said, no, wrong, try again. That's not what happens in the real world, right? What happens in the real world is we're faced with a problem and we have a number of different options that are available to us that we could take. And it might be any different number of options. It might not just be that I'm going to answer the question. It might be that I'm going to say, you know what, that's a great question. Let me investigate that for you. Let me go and find out some answers and I'm going to get back to you. And they might not like that. Maybe they wanted me to hang on or have them hang on while I investigated that. But I need to start to explore what are my different options when I'm faced with a real world problem. So you could use exploration games when you need learners to put together parts to make a whole or to solve a problem or to perform actual tasks. And so this level of gaming aligns well with the cognition in the synthesis area of Bloom's taxonomy. And so 
on screen here, you see an example, and actually it's um, going to be the one that I'm going to show, so I can pull right, oh no, it's not, sorry. It's going to be um, on screen here is a, a, a model that we built for an anti-terrorism course. And so in this course, we had um, police officers who were responding, they were kind of first responders to a potential um, terrorist attack. And so you can see that the setting, this was a picture that was taken of an alley. There's cars that are here, so that's just the backdrop that's there. And this is a picture of a steering wheel that we could potentially find in kind of the think stocks of the world. And then over on the left hand side, I have a number of different um, things that I can choose from. I've got a move the car forward, I've got report to dispatch, I've got request additional personnel, I've I've got scan and report with binoculars. I've got um, put on the gas mask, and I've got establish a perimeter. I don't have a single choice, and even within these, I'm going to be seeing the consequences of my decisions. So this is one example of an exploration game. It is. It does have the element of time that's up here, and it does kind of tell you, you know, the actions that you've taken, and it does give you consequential feedback that is so important for you to actually start to learn. But it allows the learner to explore and to kind of use the old choose your own adventure adage um, that we might be familiar with. So I'm going to go ahead and show this exploration game that we did for AutoNation. And in this course, they wanted AutoNation employees to know that there is a number of different ways that they can learn about the used vehicle inventory that they have on hand to sell. And part of the problem that they were having from a performance perspective is that the used vehicle um, employees, the sales associates, were just simply not aware of all of the used inventory that they had on hand. So a customer would come in and they said, you know, I'm kind of looking for a, um, a minivan uh, to replace my SUV. Do you have something that you might recommend for me? And so they might not know about all of the minivans that they have on stock, or they might think that they have something that is on stock and it's been sold in the last couple of days. And so what they were trying to do is to get their employees, their sales associates, to kind of get off their butts and go out there and look around, to take the cars out for test drives, to see what the inventory was on hand, to talk to the folks who knew um, if there was new trades that had come in or if there were trades that were um, recently sold. And so they allowed for this simulation to be built where in the in learners could make choices and based on their choices they would build their bank or their memory and they could potentially sell cars because they knew that that car was in stock. So I'm going to go and I'm going to launch this course and I'm not going to necessarily do so well either because it's always fun in my mind to go through and um, and make it so that it's not always the right choices that we're seeing. So. I'm going to let my screen catch up to me. Okay, so there we are in this AutoNation course. And you can see that it says activity, a day in the life of Jeff, a new sales associate. In this activity, you're going to help Jeff make decisions as he plans his day at the dealership. Remember, Jeff will be most successful when he starts his day learning about his inventory. At any point, you can view an inventory sheet of all of the vehicles Jeff has seen at the dealership by clicking this memory icon. Are we ready to get started? Let's get started. So here I can choose an area in blue for Jeff to visit. And so I'm going to go to my pre-owned display. And once I get to my pre-owned display area, you can see that I have another choice that I can make. And that is that I can talk with my coworkers or I can walk the lot. So I'm going to make the right choice right now and that's to walk the lot. And so as I'm walking the lot, I'm taking in all of the, the new cars that I see that are, or, I'm sorry, the used cars that I see that are on there. I have a little bit of feedback from a coach and I've got a memory bank that's starting to build. And so when I click on this memory bank, I can see that I just saw that I have a 2011 Camry, an 09 Chevy S10, a Toyota RAV4. So I have these um, different options here. So I'm going to go, I'm going to close out of here. And I'm going to go and I'm going to talk to my sales manager. I'm going to go to the used vehicle manager. 
And so you'll see a, a, a reuse or an, an idea of having this graphic novel is okay. So once you have these kind of tools in your toolbox, you can use them in multiple different locations. So it says your sales manager is available and we have a little conversation with our sales manager. And again, we're talking about graphics. I want you to look at the graphics. We went and we took these pictures ourselves of these folks that work for AutoNation. These are employees that work there that said, yes, we're going to go ahead and be models in your um, e-learning course and that would be great and it's fine with us and we took pictures of the backgrounds of what it looks like out there and it's not that we had this you know fancy photographer come in and take all these pictures but you can see that it says Brittany sold the Equinox and Mike sold the Ed Eddie Bauer um, expedition we got a Toyota Camry for the expedition and thanks for the update so I've learned something that they've got a Kia Soul they sold a couple of things okay so now I close out of there and all of a sudden a customer approaches me and so as Jeff is making his rounds at the dealership he is approached by a customer see if you can help Jeff respond to the customer and so the customer comes in and says hey I'm looking for a 2011 Toyota Camry I saw online first is it still available and secondly you know what's the condition so I can see if I click in my memory bank that I knew that this one had been sold and I knew that that one had been sold but lo and behold there's that 2011 Toyota Camry if I hadn't gone on that trade walk initially, I wouldn't have known that there was a 2011 Camry there. And so I can say, um, yeah, I have it in there, but just to make sure it's the same one you're referring to, do you remember any details about the car? And so I can choose that. And I can say, yeah, that was good. Yeah, it's red. It has less than 50,000 miles on it. Okay, so that's the one I'm talking about. This is great. So I have sold a car, and I can go through. So now I want to show you what it looks like if I go back to my manager a couple times. He says, hey, Steve, anything new for me? And he says, I have five minutes to shovel down this sandwich, and you're going to come in here and pester me for info? Why don't you go sell something we have instead of bugging me about the stuff that isn't even here yet? Oh, okay, sorry to bother you. And he says, hey, I appreciate your enthusiasm, but if you put half as much effort into selling the cars we actually have as you do trying to find the next great thing, you'd be top dog around here. Got it. So that might seem like very strong language to you. And I, as an instructional designer, probably fell off of my chair when my uh, client said that they wanted to do this. But the reason that we knew that this was the appropriate language and the appropriate kind of dialogue to put in here is because we talked to those subject matter enthusiasts. And so it's still playful. It still has an element of humor. But they, what they're doing is they're making that meaningful connection to what they do in real life. And if they keep going and bugging their used vehicle sales manager, they're going to get yelled at. They're going to be told, hey, scam, go out there, go find some leads, go do your work. Don't be coming come back to me because I don't have any more information for you. I already talked to you this morning. Leave me alone. I've got work to do. And that's the kind of culture and that's the kind of attitude that they have at their um, at their dealerships and so you have to kind of be able to be playful and you have to be able to be meaningful and you have to in order to do that know what these people are going to be talking about together so subject matter enthusiasts the learners that we're using within the development process are very important to us there in order to make the games real for us and not just you know our version of what it might look like I'm going to come back and as the outcome you know you could sell uh, if you kept making the wrong decisions you wouldn't sell any cars if you kept making the right decisions like if you went to the retail trade walk line if you went to the service shop if you went and did a couple of the things that are recommended as best practices you're going to see that you're going to sell more cars and that was the motivator these folks are commission based and we know that the way to get them to be excited about doing their job is if we can show them that they're going to sell more cars you know we didn't make up a fake points system we tied it to something that they actually were going to be doing and that is we had cars that were available to be sold the better you knew your inventory the better you're going to be, have a chance to sell the car we also had time and time is not arbitrary. You don't have forever to complete this interaction because you don't have forever in a day. You have an eight hour shift that you work and you have things that need to be done. So each time that you go to the service manager, or each time that you go to the used vehicle manager, you're taking time to walk over there, to have a conversation with them, and then to come back again. And so time goes away from you. 
And just like in real time, in real world, you don't have the opportunity to add more time. So we made sure that the learning and the learning game that we built in here inside this course, you know, this was one interaction inside an entire course. This wasn't the entire course for us. This one interaction is gamified. It has the elements of gaming. It has an appealing context. It has a risk. It has challenge. It has reward. It has consequence. It has time. It has a lot of the elements of gaming. And and it was, like I said, one in a series of an entire course. It's not just um, that one interaction all the way through. So finally, when we get up to the very top of this taxonomy uh, alignment for gaming, we are at the simulation games. And so here we're talking about simulated worlds immersive environments, free roaming and collaborative play. It might be multiple players. And so at this point we're looking for the design, the compose, the formulate, the prepare, those very high order thinking skills that are in the Bloom's taxonomy. Um, it is optimal when you are simulating activities in real life in the form of a game. Usually there are no strictly defined goals in the game. Instead, the players are allowed to move freely and they're allowed to control a character. Simulation games are often set in a very rich contextual setting to allow for learners to recognize the similarity between the game and his or her day-to-day -day work environment. You want to use um, simulation games when you're talking about the psychomotor skill development. And so, um, you know, one of our clients is Lardell, and Lardell is um, the the authors and the creators, uh, developers of a, a product called Sim Man and Sim Baby, and these these are simulation dolls that um, that actually will react to what doctors are doing based on the case that they put into the simulation. Okay, these are simulation games. These are things that people can do. These are flight simulators or train driving simulators. Um, they are also potential as e-learning courses. And when they are a potential for e-learning courses is something like when we're talking about software training. So software training is often seen as the most boring type of training that there is. And the reason in my opinion that that is the case is because we push the learners through a common set of um, events for most software training that we do. We push them through um, this series of I'm going to show you, I'm going to tell you, I'm going to, uh, or I'm going to tell you, I'm going to show you, I'm going to guide you, and I'm going to ask you, right? So I'm going to, I'm going to go through that series and that order. And instead, what we're asking you to do is we're asking you, you to put the learners directly into that simulation. And so I'm going to pull up that course now. If you just give me one second, I have to pull it up. Um, I'm just going to pause my screen sharing. I don't have that one pulled up real quick. Carrie, start writing down those questions because I know we're getting close to the end, and so I want to make sure that we can answer those questions I'm while writing. I pull up the game. You're writing. <laughs> I'm writing <Okay>. away. <laughs> okay, good. Okay. Okay, I'm going to come back to sharing, and I'm going to pull up this simulation. Okay, hopefully you can see my screen now. All right, so we're going to come in here as a nurse and pharmacy staff, and this was a, a course that we did, and I'm just going to fly through that. That was kind of the simulation of how this is going to work, the onboarding, and I do want to make sure that we have enough. We're going to change some patient um, information. So we've got Mr. Albert Einstein. He's 52 years old. He's admitted to the emergency room. He has a high fever and he complains of chest pain radiating down his left arm. Using ICIS, the patient's information is just a few clicks away. So what we do is we run through this onboarding where we go through the different steps of how to do this. You're going to be given a task list. You're going to be given this screen that you run through and you're going to be given steps to complete this task. So I'm going to go through each of these and all of these demos are available. We have you know potential for you to, to, to get these demos um, or most of them that I've shown today. So I was just told that I needed to change his um, drug interaction. And so I'm going to go and I'm going to say a hint, and I can show what that hint is. But 
I was never walked through what I'm just asked to do. So I'm going to come in here and I'm maybe going to just try it myself. And so I'm going to review this history. Nope, that's not right. So I'm going to go ahead and get the details here. And I'm going to change, you know, what the situation is. I was immediately thrown into this scenario. I was immediately thrown into this situation. This is almost like a software simulation in the fact that <clears throat> I'm making choices and I'm seeing reactions to the choices. I'm not given the typical guide me, show me, tell me, do me. I'm actually given an open area for me to go in and, and learn and play and experiment and safely. <laughs> So with that, I'm going to come back over, um, and I'm going to ask for some questions from you all. Carrie, you on mute? Yes, here I am. <laughs> um, so one of the questions that was just asked a few minutes ago by Nancy was, how did your clients know of the the if the games were successful in changing employees behavior versus instructor-led training or boring e-learning. I'm thinking back to when you're showing the automation one. Right, right. So um, what we have to do and what we follow is a process where in which we're having a savvy start and we go in and we have a brainstorming meeting or we have a conversation with our client stakeholders and we say, what does success look like to you? And what are your existing business metrics that you're currently focused on fixing? And so what you're trying to do is you're trying to move that that needle and what we often find as instructional designers is that we make up metrics so we might make up like level one level two type of things but in today's world data is being saved and data is being captured at an almost an alarming rate right but there are so many data points that we can um, touch upon that we should be able to find something that they want to improve. After all, there was a driver for this training in the first place. What was it that drove this training? Is it a lack of sales? Is it that we want to increase the sales? Is it what, that we want to decrease the call time? Whatever those real performance objectives are, start, look at that data as it is today, and then look at that data after you launch the new course. And you should be able to see the difference. And again, we have that automation case study that really details out the process that we followed in order to do that. Am I on? Am I on? Yes, I? you're on. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Getting messed up on my mute button. Um, so another question Alice asked was, um, SMEs develop content and love the e-read format. How do you introduce them to games? That's a great question, and that's one that we often face as well, because what happens when people hire somebody like Alan Interactions, who is kind of known for our, um, our instructional design and our game-like approach, um, is that we walk into organizations where stakeholders and executives have never seen our work before, have no idea, they have an idea of what training looks like and what they've experienced in the past. And so what I have suggested and what I think would be a really cool way to drive this home is to provide them two different e-learning courses and it might be something simple that you create on your own it could be you know how to make a peanut butter and jelly sandwich it might be something completely removed from context of what the the work world is like but that you show them that they have a better uh, time that they're more engaged when they do something that is less familiar you know that is less of the point click point click answer a question now I often talk about how we can potentially move the needle and what I'm trying to, to do and what I'm hoping that you guys out there will will join me in doing is saying our learners are being burdened by this and they're not enjoying it and you know my Twitter handle is learner advocate for a reason because I really feel bad for the learners who have to consume this content and you're spending all of this time in terms of seat time for learners, in terms of development time, in terms of legal review and compliance reviews and marketing reviews of all of the courses that you put out there. Let's make it something that people enjoy doing. Let's make it something that's worth their while. And let's make it something that they can actually take and, and learn from. And people do not learn by reading vast amounts of information. There are tons of studies that you can pull up online about the, the amount, if, you, if you're just providing reading and that very basic level of information sharing, you're not going to get performance change. They're not going to know how to apply what they've read to their job unless you allow them to opportunity to practice that in a real world environment. 
Okay, um, we just have a few minutes left, so yes. I thought we'd wrap up. There was a question about seeing an example of a compliance game. I don't mm -hmm. know if you had anything on hand that we could show after I, we wrap things up if people want to stay on. They could see uh, yeah, that. we do. Yeah, we do have an example of an information security course that we've um, put together that is a compliance training type of a course. And so we could certainly spend some time if you have, you know, a few minutes to hang on, and I can show that. Um, and then I know that we do have some other um, opportunities to provide, you know, demos on kind of a one-on-one -on -one basis if somebody wants to reach out to us, and we can showcase right. some of these demos to us. So. Um, I'm going to turn it over to you, Carrie, um, and, and let you run through the, the final wrap-up. And then if people want to stay on the line, we'll just go ahead and continue with that example with the um, information uh, awareness, security awareness. Sure. So just a few resources we wanted to make you aware of, some things that Angel covered today, um, context challenge activity feedback. We have a white paper and on-demand webinar specifically on that that we will make sure you get. If you go out to our website, alleninteractions.com, it's under um, the resources section. And there's also one on creating motivating e-learning. Um, both of these are written by our chief instructional strategist, Ethan Edwards. And we also have many of the demos that Angel showed today are available on our website. So you just need to go under outinteractions.com slash portfolio and you can get to them there or this link that's showing up on the screen right now, that'll get you there too. So, um, and then the last thing is Zebra Zaps. We mentioned this building serious games with Zebra Zaps webinar. There's an on demand version that you can gain ac access to. Um, the link that's available, we'll also put that in the chat window. But we'll also send out an email about the, the live webinar that's happening next week and details on that if you want to register for that. And that's with Steve Lee. And he'll be showing how to build that demo that Angel showed of the, the kitchen, cooking in the kitchen. <laughs> the Denny's. <laughs> the Denny's. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay, so um, for those of you that can stay on the line, I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to go ahead and launch that um, example that I was talking about with the information security. So let me um, quit out of this one and pull this up. Sorry, this is kind of on the fly. So <laughs> um, forgive me. Okay, so information security is this one. Okay, so this is the employee cer um, cer security course, and this is something that you would probably have in a compliance training environment. And what you would do in this case is you're looking for um, potential violence and potential, you know, threats for this. So um, what we do is we roll our mouses o our mouse over the animated employees to hear little snippets of conversation, and we're going to drag the most immediate threat into your office and discuss the comments. So this is your office. So if I hold this over here, two things would solve the department's problems: gasoline and a match. My boyfriend was so late getting to my place. We missed the movie. I wanted to kill him. I hate this. Beep project. Everyone is stupid and beep incompetent. Um, the stupid printer always screws up documents. I really hate this dumb machine. Or some days you just want to end it all. And so if you're a manager, you might choose that this someday you want to end it all is the most um, pressing need and you're going to drag this person into your office. And so you might get some of this while the employee is definitely troubled, there's another situation in the office more pressing. Please try to find the higher ranking concern. And so um, I think that this guy would probably be it. And he says two things would solve this department's problems, gasoline and a match. We send it in here. Absolutely, an employee who threatens implicitly or explicitly other employees is the highest priority and must be dealt with first. A threat to employee is safety is defined by Corning, this was for Corning, as a troubling situation. So these are the kinds of um, uh, questions that you should ask this person, like what is upsetting you? Um, you get the answer, I never get any real work done, I'm stuck in a rut. So this type of training is good for workplace safety training and so uh, being able to deal with um, the compliance issues of being prepared and um, warning signs for potential violence. I have one more that I want to share, and that is hopefully in here. Um, maybe I don't have that one. We also have a compliance training course that we developed where you look around the room and you see um, potentials 
for information security violations, so passwords that are being shared and shouted out loud, a video camera that's being um, unplugged from the ceiling, and you have to spot all of the, the ways in which information security might be violated. So just because the course is a compliance training course doesn't mean that it isn't ripe for ways for you to game it. It's just you have to make sure that if there is specific wording that you need to have, that you really use those resource tools that we talked about earlier to make sure that the policy manuals and the policy documents are included in there. As a prior um, career before coming to Allen Interactions, I was actually in charge of compliance training for a while and I found ways and I found some of the best courses that I've ever had are those that make you make those ethical decisions and those ethical dilemmas when you are faced with a compliance challenge and really that's where the entire organization can crumble. If you think about you know, the, the Arthur Andersons of the world, um, the Enrons, they made compliance mistakes so if we could really drive home performance change when it comes to uh, making sure that the compliance is is in line and that the employees are behaving the way that they're expected to behave, you're really going to be able to save some face and to save some dollars. So thank you for those of you who are able to stay on for the extra couple of minutes and I look forward to hearing from you. You can follow me on Twitter, you can tweet us with some questions and we are going to be taking the questions that you have provided today and following up with that and you will also be receiving the tag tool and the guide that comes along with it. So thank you all and have a wonderful rest of the day.